Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes. Good, thank you. you turn off that one? Should I make it worse? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, uh, hi Sarah, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Yeah, all well, thank you. So thank you for being with us today. We'll wait just a little more so that people can join us. And we will start afterwards. So how are things at Pokhara? Uh, good. good. It's warm here, but good, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get some rain soon. Yeah, no, we're doing well, though. Yeah. We're having a good day. Uh, anyway. yeah, just came in, came in from work a little bit ago. and. Okay. We had lots of some new stroke patients today, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good day. Good day. How was your day? Yeah, I'm 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 off today, so I have my compressed day off. So, uh, in the morning I was trying to work out something for Sun and doing a little bit of documents and other things. Yeah, been okay so far. Good. Glad to hear it. Yeah. So, uh, I'll just uh, in the meantime to all the participants who are here today. We are going to make it a little bit more interactive today. So what will happen is first part, we'll have uh, the presentation which Sarah will do. And by the end of that, we'll share you a link. So in that link, you'll have 10 multiple choice questions, which you can, you know, you, you, you try to answer all those questions. And when we come for the second part, we might have a discussion based upon those questions as well as extra whatever we have, like we get questions from you. And by the end of the presentation, like when the second part ends, we'll give you one more form to fill. And once you fill the form, a certificate will be issued to you within another hour or two. You'll get all the certificates which will be mailed to you for today's webinar. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and I'll reintroduce Sarah to everyone. So she's been here a few weeks back as well when we talked about functional goal setting. So today we are going to talk about uh, <clears throat> more of like cognitive linguistic assessment and management part. And Sarah has agreed to save some of the materials which we will be mailing it to you uh, um, as soon as possible. Uh, so about Sarah, she's, she has more than like 12 years of experience in uh, speech and hearing, speech language pathology field. She graduated from East Carolina University, so has worked in various setups, and she uh, has experience of working in dysphagia to end life palliative cares. She was already working in Mission Hospital in Tansen, and now she works in Pokhara in INF. So we are happy to have you here, and if you can share your screen, and we can go ahead okay. with the presentation. Sounds good. Well, thank you all for having me back. Let's see if I do this correctly. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, we play from start. Okay, I think it's working. Uh, you can see the screen, everyone, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for having me back. I, um, it's, good to, it's good to be able to connect with you all and learn more. I put my email address on here. Again, if you have any direct questions for me, you're welcome to always email me. Um, and this presentation on cogn cognitive linguistic assessment and treatment is one that's adapted from two of my friends in the United States um, at a hospital I used to work at. So I wanted to be sure to give them credit. Um, it's a very long presentation. They put so much details in it. I will not go through slide by slide, but as Bebeck mentioned, if you, on the form that he has, if you put your email address in, we'll email you the um, the presentation because there's so many good treatment ideas that all throughout the presentation so I want you to have the information. Um, so first just a few definitions and again you guys know these so I'm going to go quickly. Traumatic brain injury is um, impact to the head. It can either be a closed injury which means nothing visible from the outside or it can be an open injury where you see skull you see um, difficulties and oftentimes you have a coup and a contra coup or an acceleration deceleration injury um, where the brain kind of moves forward and back. Acquired brain injury versus a traumatic brain injury um, because the two terms are a bit different. Um, some of the treatment things are the same but it's good to kind of think about how did the injury happen 
And then what does that mean for treatment? What does that mean for probable deficits? Acquired brain injuries are any brain or any damage caused to the brain that's not necessarily caused by an external force. Hypoxia, stroke, tumors, um, degenerative disorders, drowning, strangulations, hanging injuries, um, that's a type of hypoxic brain injury, of course, all are acquired brain injuries. Traumatic brain injuries, as we said, you know, is a blow to the head. Oftentimes, traumatic brain injuries have much more widespread symptoms and effects um, because the whole brain is involved. You know, a stroke is usually more localized or a tumor is usually more localized than a traumatic brain injury. Um, a type of traumatic brain injury is a concussion. Um, concussions do not show up on head CTs or on MRIs. 75% of all the TBIs a year uh, worldwide are usually concussions. They're considered mild traumatic brain injuries. Um, so that's one that's often missed. Um, oftentimes people say, oh yeah, the head CT looks good. We don't need speech therapy. Um, but then the patient goes home and they are having trouble in school. They're having trouble with headaches. They're having trouble with attention um, or irritability. And it's all because it's a post-concussive syndrome. So just because a head CT is normal doesn't mean that there's not a role for speech therapy to be involved. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these slides. These are all different types of traumatic brain injuries. It's good to know about them, but we're not going to take the time today to look at all of these different types. Um, hypoxic and anoxic brain injuries are also a type that are often overlooked because head CTs normally, or head CTs or MRIs look normal, um, unless if it's very severe or very long after. Um, anoxic brain injury means complete lack of oxygen to the brain. Hypoxic means there's a restriction of oxygen. So if someone has a long seizure, um, it can be a hypoxic brain injury. If someone is uh, almost drowned, has to be revived. If someone has um, a heart attack and it takes a while to get the heart going again, you know, you think about that, the blood's gonna stop pumping, that can cause hypoxic brain injuries. Um, so the initial loss of consciousness usually can be a comatose state. And then it can take lots of different amounts of time to regain consciousness. Um, oftentimes with hypoxic or anoxic brain injuries, the damage is also more like a traumatic brain injury where it's a lot less localized and you see kind of a very um, diverse pattern of brain injury, much more so than a stroke. Um, and then just, I thought this graphic was cute and so I put it in. A little bit about the difference between a uh, left hemisphere CVA or stroke and a right hemisphere CVA. Um, I think we all are very familiar with our left hemispheres. These are our patients with aphasia, um, apraxia, you know, lots of comprehension deficits. They can't talk or their speech doesn't come out clear. Right hemisphere strokes often to me look a lot more like traumatic brain injury patients. They tend to have um, less awareness of their deficits, a shorter attention span. Um, much more impulsive, they have impaired judgment. These are the people that um, they just seem off. They don't seem normal, but their speech comes out fine, their language comes out fine. So oftentimes also doctors or other professionals will say, oh, you don't, they don't need speech therapy, they're totally normal. Um, but then we go see them and we think, oh, they're, they're not normal. They're fighting with everybody. They're falling down because they're forgetting that they have uh, hemiparesis. Um, they have no concept of time, they have poor attention. Um, so these are just a few things if you're thinking about your personal assessment of uh, CVAs or strokes, what are some things that you may need to add on when you're assessing a right hemisphere CVA instead of a left hemisphere okay, CVA? For a left hemisphere CVA, you know, that's our, that's our normal, that's what we see all the time. Um, of course, we're going to do our full language assessment, our full expressive, receptive, all of those things. For a right hemisphere CVA, we will probably be able to quickly screen those things because they'll probably be pretty normal, maybe some dysarthria. Um, but we really need to look into attention, memory, money calculations, because a lot of our mathematics are housed in our right hemisphere. So, you know, one of the questions I usually ask is, you know, I kind of think about roughly, um, you know, you need to go to the store and you need to buy uh, tomatoes and they cost 50 rupees for a kg of tomatoes. 
and you need um, eggs. And to get 10 eggs, it's going to be, this is so hard, well, I can't even do my math right now myself. Um, you know, you're gonna get 15 eggs and that's gonna be, how much is that? I think that's like 150 rupees in this bad guys, I can't remember. Um, and then you're gonna get a choco uh, for your child and that's 10 rupees. You brought 300 rupees, is it enough or is it not enough? So asking them to think about common things, ooh, okay, yes, that's enough or no, that's not enough. Um, those types of questions are really good to do with right hemisphere CPA patients, especially ones who seem normal. It'd be good to see if they can do those basic calculations. Um, you'll do a clock drawing, and for them, you'll be looking at clock drawing for spatial awareness, um, lots of reasoning, problem solving, and safety. And all throughout this presentation, if I don't show you everything, um, a lot of questions and stimuli that I give for all these different areas is mixed into the presentation. So you'll be able to go back and see those as well. The test I put at the top, the Evanston Northwestern Healthcare Right Hemisphere Screen, the five test that I'll um, scan. And I'll scan. Yes, I don't think you're talking to us, maybe. If your microphone's not on mute, maybe it would be good to mute it. Um, but I'll send you that, a PDF of that test as well, just because it is in English, um, but you will, you know, the way I use it in practice and we use it here at Green Pastures is we just kind of translate it and we use it more for the, less for the standardization and more for just the idea of the areas to cover the parameters. Um, so I thought it would be nice to do a quick case study mixed in. And these are two patients that we saw last week actually that were both um, inpatient stroke patients, stroke rehab patients at our hospital here. Um, Open, I spelled his name different ways in different places. Poor Deepika, the other speech therapist. Um, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, but I cannot get the aspirated k, k with the M right. So Kim is what I'm going to say, but I know that that's wrong. Um, so Kim was a 30-ish year old male, some education. Um, he had a right hemisphere CVA, so left hemiplegia, um, and normal swallowing, but some dysphonia. Very poor reasoning, uh, poor attention, severely impairment, quickly angry with people. He, he liked to do therapy with Deepika and he didn't like to do much other therapy. So he, he kind of picked and chose who he would do therapy with. And then on the other um, side was Hari, who's 50 year old, classic left hemisphere stroke, swallowing became normal. He could do a few single word utterances. Sorry for my spelling mistakes in here. I was typing like right before <laughs> it started. Um, very severe apraxia of speech, but good cognition, pragmatics, and um, good interactions. So on two separate occasions with both of these gentlemen, we were playing a card game named Uno. It's an easy card game. There's colors and there's numbers on the cards. And so the basic premise is you're playing cards and you either have to match the pile in the middle by, you either have to put down the same color or the same number. So color or number. Those are your two choices. Uh, Kim, you know, should have been able to do this, but because his memory was so poor, his attention was so poor, and his um, just general interaction was so poor because he was a right hemisphere CVA, every time it was his turn, we would have to say, Kim, it's your turn. And he would just pick a card from his hand and throw it down. I say, no, it's got to either be same color or same number. And he would kind of fuss with us and we'd have to give him two choices usually. Does this one work or does this one work? And if he paid attention, he could do it, but it was a, it was a painful card game. <laughs> um, poor Deepa and I were sitting there and it took um, over 15 minutes to go through one round of this game. Um, Hardy was in the bed over, he was watching and he was laughing and he wanted us to play with him too. So we took it over and we thought, well, he can do naming colors and numbers as an apraxia of speech task. Immediately, Hari knew how to play. You know, this guy had never seen, neither one of them had seen the game before. Um, Hari picked up how to play, uh, couldn't express it, you know, still was having the classic aphasia, apraxia symptom, symptoms of every color was nilo, nilo, blue, blue, blue. And so we're like, you know, we're working on that. But he knew how to play the game. He was keeping track of whose turn it was. He could figure out the nuance of, if I don't have the same color, I can play the same number. Um, he figured it out within two rounds. 
and needed very few cues to do that afterwards. So we could use it for his language instead. It was just a really great example back to back of both of these gentlemen were doing stroke rehab, but their goals were totally different because of which brain hemisphere was affected. Um, so therefore their goals were really different. Um, all right, so I'm gonna kind of skim through a lot of this. Um, you guys read over it on your own later. Lots of cognitive deficits following traumatic brain injuries, attention, alertness, memory, um, executive functioning, um, thought organization, judgment and reasoning for insight into their deficits. You know, maybe they have severe hemiplegia now and you say, you know, what are you going to do differently um, to follow your injury? I don't have to do anything differently. I'm fine. And then we're sitting there and they, they can't move this arm at all. And we all, or they can't move their arm in. Like and we're thinking, no, you, you can't. You need help now to walk or you need a wheelchair. No, no, I'm fine. I'll do everything the same. I'll go back to my job. Um, emotional control, you know, quick emotional ability going from tears to anger very quickly, um, very impulsive. If they have something they want to say, usually that's an interruption and can't stop themselves from saying it. Um, some of the worst um, the non-compliments of appearance have come from people with traumatic brain injuries, you know, why did you dress like that? Why do you look so tired? Is your, did you fix your hair today? Did you, you're getting fatter than last time I saw you. These are all pretty um, common with traumatic brain injury patients. You kind of have to develop a little bit of a, know that they're a brain injury patient or you can be very offended by them. Um, so the next, the next little bit is about very low level brain injury patients. Um, some trauma centers, uh, in the United States, and that's just my background, so I'll speak about that. Um, say that cognitive evaluations should be done, evaluations and educations should be done on any patient who comes in with an intracranial bleed, a positive loss of consciousness, if they had repetitive questioning at the scene. So, you know, they fall, they didn't lose consciousness, their head CT looks normal, but they keep saying, what happened to me? What happened to me? What happened to me? What happened to me? Um, altered GCS, which is Glasgow Coma Scale, and then family, medical staff, or the patients report that they're not feeling right. Um, these things were never in place um, when I worked in Tencent at the Mission Hospital. We would often find patients later who had had a 15-minute loss of consciousness, um, but only ortho injury, so we would kind of go back in when PT and OT saw and found out that they were having some cognitive deficits as well. But these are all areas just to kind of be thinking about and as you're educating doctors about your role, um, these are, you know, these are good pointers to bring up to the doctors. The Glasgow Coma Scale is a pretty universally known scale. Um, it's, it's the most basic scale you can get uh, for any kind of brain injury, acquired brain injury or traumatic. It's an eye-opening verbal response and motor response. Knowing this scale and kind of knowing the range of numbers is good for us as speech pathologists because oftentimes doctors will say GCS of 6 or GCS of 14 or GCS of uh, 9. And just knowing those ranges and knowing what it means and being able to document that in our notes um, just gives us common language to speak to doctors and other professionals. Uh, the next scale that is kind of all throughout this presentation is the Ranchos Los Amigos levels of cognitive functioning scale. It's not used, um, it's, it's not used as much in Asia from what I've been able to find, but I left it in here and I, because I just liked the way that it was divided um, in the presentation. So the scale goes from one to 10 and patients progress through the stages at different rates. Uh, level one is a comatose state, pretty much no response. Uh, alive but not doing much else and a level 10 is uh, close to normal understands their own deficits and able to kind of do things independently so you have this scale from 1 to 10. Um, people don't have to progress from a 1 to a 2 to a 3. Sometimes the patient's comatose and then the next day they can wake up and be agitated which is a level 4 and then some people also plateau. Everyone, as you guys know, with every disorder, doesn't get too perfect. Um, so everyone doesn't become a 10 on this scale. Um, to me, having a scale like this makes, even if it's just in my own brain and no one around me, 
uses it. It just helps me to kind of think through, are they progressing or not? And is this a normal progression? Um, so here's just kind of a quick breakdown of what we're looking at. Most of the people we see probably for speech therapy as inpatients uh, while they're still in the hospital will be between a one to a six. Usually sevens and eights are not gonna be caught. Those are gonna be caught later. Seven, eight, nine, and 10 are gonna be caught when they try to go back to work and they realize they can't do their job. And then they'll say, wait a minute, something's wrong. And hopefully somebody will say speech therapy can help with cognition. Um, so the first three are the kind of coma state. Um, you know, vegetative state, slow, slow responses, very minimal responses. These, are, these patients are still in the ICU or HDU. They may still be on a ventilator. They may have, they definitely have a feeding tube in. These are the people that people just say, oh, they're alive, but not, not doing great. Um, so like I said, I'm just gonna keep going. You guys can read over these things later, especially the tips for interaction. Um, and then one of the things I wanted to highlight for you all was one of the cognitive tests that I'll scan and email to you. Um, and I will not email tonight. I'll try to do it before the end of the week. I still need to scan a lot of these paper forms. I only have the paper copies. Um, but one of these scales is called the Rapaport. And then the other one is called the JFK Coma Recovery Scale. I'm going to send you both of these because I know when I was a new SLP and working in trauma situations for the first time, and somebody said, just go in and do some coma, um, coma stimulation. And I remember feeling so intimidated that I didn't know what to do with this patient who was lying in the bed, pretty much comatose, couldn't respond to me, couldn't talk. And I thought, what am I doing here? Looking at the Rapaport and then looking at the JFK, there are two assessments, but from those assessments, you can learn a lot of therapy goals. You know, patient will respond to auditory stimuli. Patient will respond to olfactory stimuli. Um, patient will respond to tactile stimuli. And so these, these things are very key things that we can do. And they're also proven that the more stimulation we give to a certain point, of course, we don't want to agitate the patient. But if we stimulate for short periods of time, we can aid in brain recovery. So going in, you know, and asking, you know, ringing a bell beside the patient's ear and seeing if you get a flicker of eye movement, seeing if you get a bit of a head turn, you know, putting a little bit of spirit or ammonia or something kind of a really strong smell underneath someone's nose um, and seeing if you get any kind of, you know, nasal flaring or lip grimacing. These are usually really good signs that some kind of brain activity is going on. Um, of course, you know, the doctors will hook them up to EEG machines and different machines to look for brain activity. But once they've determined that they do have brain activity, but they're not waking up, a lot of times the doctors don't know what to do. We can have a key role in coma stimulation by doing some of these things. Um, in one of the case studies I'm going to show you at the end, um, because we were able to go in and spend 15 minutes with a patient who was, you know, a very low level in kind of the vegetative state, we got some of these responses from him, some of these basic responses, and it was able to give the family hope. It was able to show the doctors that he did, it would benefit him to stay in the hospital longer. And also we were able to um, teach the family some of these really good stimulation things. So just because someone can't talk or they're not responding to other people doesn't mean that if you go in and spend a bit more time with them, you, you, you couldn't be the one that gets the responses. Um, so that's an encouragement to you all about this low level um, goals. Again, throughout this, there's all these different goal examples. Um, the other stage that is usually one of the most difficult for people to work with is uh, it's called a Ranches level four, and it's when the patient is confused and agitated. So they've woken up and they're fighting. These are the patients that usually have to be um, sometimes, I don't wanna say, I think, I can't think of a better term, so tied to the bed, they have to be restrained uh, because they're a threat. You know, they're pulling out their IV lines, they're pulling out their NGTs, they're taking off their oxygen, 
They don't know what's wrong. They're asking questions. They're constantly moving. Um, and everyone thinks this is a horrible eight stage. We should hang on just a minute. There's a, a bulldozer outside of my house. I'm going to go close the door. Okay. Yeah. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please keep it to yourself. And when we start the second session, and you can post the questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm back. I'm uh, sorry. They're digging up our road. Yeah. Um, no <laughs> this this stage is no one likes this stage. Um, it's a great stage though because it means they woke up. Um, and a lot of times when people start getting agitated, pulling things. Everyone's first response is, well, we should give them, we should sedate them. They're, they're too agitated, we should sedate them. But the thing for us to remember and for us to remind other people is, they just woke up. They were, they were in a vegetative state before. Agitation is a good sign. It shows that their brain is recovering. Of course, if they need to sleep at night, you can talk about medicines and things for sleeping at night. But this stage, while it is difficult, is usually a very important stage in brain injury recovery. At this stage, you're not going to argue with the patient. You know, if they keep pulling and saying, I don't need my, I don't need this line, I don't need this IV, and pulling, 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 arguing is not going to work. They don't have the cognitive abilities yet to reason. That, that part of their brain is injured. Um, but redirection works. Oh, do you want to see a picture of my son on my phone? Oh, good. Hey, what's that over there? This is the time to use their lack of attention and sustained attention to their benefit. Um, you need to keep it calm. You need to not yell at them and scold them. They're not going to understand these things. Redirection is really the best um, thing to do. Um, usually and hopefully, the patient will be able to move out of the agitated stage into just a confused stage. This is where they're constantly asking, why am I here? Where am I? What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? This is going to be the stage where um, we, there was a old movie called, and it had a, what's it called? 50 first dates in the U.S. It was an old one. And there was someone that they called 10 second Tom because he lost his memory from an accident. And he would ask the same questions every 10 seconds. Every time he met someone, he thought it was the first time because he asked every 10 seconds. That's this stage. So we're constantly reminding them, you know, it's, um, I, I can't even, oh, we're not in jet anymore. Right, let's see, what are we? We're in June. June. It's June 16th. You're in the hospital because you had an injury. You fell down. We're here to help you. You're safe. This is a good stage if they're able to read at this stage to write down a cue card and do some space retrieval techniques. What do you do when you feel anxious? I read my card. Card would have your basic information on it. So this is a stage that's just going to need lots of redirection and need lots of simplicity. Maybe a list. I brush my teeth. I wash my face. I eat breakfast. I do my physical therapy. I take a rest. This stage needs uh, quite a bit of direction. Um, when we're doing cognitive assessments and evaluations for people who are at these confused stages, a lot of times they're not going to be able to tolerate a um, formalized assessment. And if they do tolerate it, then that's going to show severe deficits because they have severe deficits. Lots of times at this stage, doing a bit of more of an informal evaluation that can be done across multiple sessions is much better. So looking at their orientation, attention, memory, language, and executive functions are usually enough in this stage. Um, and then, like I said, I'm not going to review all of this. I'm going to send it to you. But there's tons of different activities and goals that you can do. When you get to these higher levels of brain injury, um, the Rancho 6, 7, and 8, these are people who are still confused, but they're starting to come out of it. These are people who say, if I say, what's my name? And they say, I know your face you're from America. And I say, that's right, but what's my name? Am I Shanti or am I Sarah? And they still they say, oh, you're Shanti. And I said, no, I'm Sarah. So they, they're starting to recognize, they're starting to say, I'm not at home, I'm in a hospital. Um, they can do some things independently, but aren't really safe because they're forgetting about their deficits. So for this stage, this is where you start to put a little bit more on them. 
Um, you know, when they repetitively ask, where am I? What's happened? What, what should you do? Oh, I should check my sheet. Oh, what do you do first every day? I don't know. You should look at your list because you do know what you should do every day. This is a lot more. I always think this is kind of, if you're a parent, I don't know if you guys do where you start to want your children to be more independent. And so you start at you know, first, we do everything for the time to put on your shoes and you're, you're helping them do it. And then, you know, as they get older, we say, what do you need to do? Oh, I need to get my jacket and my shoes. You know, we're trying to make them think about the task, but still giving guidance. Um, and then as we keep going, um, Rancho's sevens are very automatic. These are people who are functioning well, but they seem very robotic. They don't have, they're not able to do the humor. They're not able to do a lot of the interaction. They seem um, very robotic, very focused on the tasks that they have. Um, and then Rancho's eights are getting much better. This is usually probably when they're going home, um, coming in for outpatient therapy. Um, they're starting to realize that they do have deficits and they're able to use their routines on their own, but they still need a lot of help with that. Um, so what I've done in these next few slides is I've gone through and just listed kind of everything I do in an informal assessment. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to hit every part of it. Um, the good thing to do if you're doing an assessment and you think, I don't know how to write this so that other people can understand it. The main, these bullet points, orientation, attention, memory, are the bullet points that I write in my narrative. And then beside it, I write how they did. Do they have deficits? And if so, in what? So those, these are my parameters that I'm looking at. Um, I'm, and I'll send you the cognitive assessment form that we actually just finished developing at Green Pastures um, so that if any of you guys wanted to look over that and try to do that, you could. I've put some examples of different tasks underneath so that you can start thinking about the different areas that we use. You know, in attention, we have sustained attention. Can they follow enough to count from one to 20? We have selective attention. I'm gonna say a list of words that start with a B. Every time you hear a word that starts with B, raise your hand. Banana, dog, book. Um, this is hard for me to do because I'm making up the words myself. Uh, tree, you know, so can they follow with raising and lowering the hand in the same way? Uh, you know, memory, I'm going to tell you four, four words. I want you to remember them. Can they remember immediately? Can they remember afterwards? Can they remember numbers? Um, thought organization. Can you tell me how to make, um, do chia, tell me how to make milk tea. What do I need to do first? You know, can they remember first you get the pot, then you put in the milk and the water. If you do water, then you put in the chia pati, then you put in the sugar. And if you want the spices, then you put that in, you let it boil, then you pour it through the strainer into your teacup. Can they tell you all of those steps? Or do they just say, you just make tea? That's not telling me the steps. That's not a thought organization task. Um, you know, doing some problem solving, reasoning. Why should children go to school? Because they should. That's not a full answer. Children should go to school so that they learn, so that they can, you know, have a better future. Any of these types of things would be better. Um, one of the other questions I really like is give two different solutions to a problem. This shows mental flexibility. So maybe uh, you're on the bus and it breaks down. Well, one thing you can do is you can sit and wait. Another thing you can do is you can try to flag down another bus, right? So there's two choices to a lot of our life situations. Some, some things obviously have one safe choice, but some things have a lot more flexibility. You know, if someone asks you for money, you can give it to them or you can say, I can't give it to you. You know, you can, you can make choices. Um, executive function, you know, the clock drawing one is a typical task we do for right hemisphere patients. When they draw a clock, you'll be really seeing a lot more uh, right hemisphere stroke patients, I should say you'll be drawing a clock and you'll usually see a lot of left visual neglect. So all the numbers will be crowded onto the right side of the clock, but to them, they'll look normal. For a patient with a traumatic brain injury, if you ask them to draw a clock, you're gonna see a lot of decreased attention and you're gonna see a lot of poor planning. So you'll maybe have the circle. And then um, typically what I see is they'll put the one, two, three in the right place. 
lose attention, lose planning. Sometimes the four will just kind of trail beside the three and go to the side. Usually the task is not finished. Um, so using the same task, but for different reasons. Um, safety awareness is important. What do you do if you start to feel sick again and you're by yourself? You know, can they reason through, I've got paralysis now, I should call someone. Or do they say, I'll get up and go to the doctor. You won't be able to anymore because you, you had this injury. Um, so can they know what to do in the current situation? There are also a huge list right here of different standardized assessments that are used by lots of different people. Um, the only one that I know of right now that's uh, standard, or sorry, that's been translated into Nepali is the RUDAS. Um, the other ones, when I use them, I just, we just translate as well as we can. Um, I put a copy of the RUDAS here. Uh, it's really hard to see, uh, but they just have a lot of the other functions that we have looked at before in them. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you four words, try to remember them. Uh, can you, how would you make the shape out of these four sticks, kind of some spatial awareness types of things, that type of task. Um, and like I said, I'm just going to kind of flip through these. These are all available. If you just Google it, you can pull up a PDF easily and print these out. Um, yeah, and then these are just different ideas of treatment goals and activities for different levels of patients. Your higher level patients, the 9 and 10, these are the patients that you're going to um, possibly see as outpatients, maybe these are the people that if they were teachers, businessmen, um, you know, highly educated doctors, you know, professionals before their injury, these are the people that are going to come back afterwards. You know, if they were doing uh, some other job before that didn't require a lot of education, they're probably not going to notice the deficits. Uh, these are people who say, I used to be able to multitask and do 15 things at once, and now I can't even remember what I'm supposed to do. Um, it looks like the time is almost finished. Yeah. So, uh, what we'll we not there yeah. Oh. Uh, on the chat section, if you see, I've said a link where you can go. And then there are 10 questions which we would like you to attempt and answer those. And then click the second link and we'll continue from there. Is that okay? Sounds good. Yeah. So kindly go to the chat section. There's the link at the end of the chat and click on that and we'll see you in a bit. Uh, kindly select the second link for the webinar. Okay, see you in a bit. Thank you. A lot of the therapy things I do are all kind of in that, um, in that PowerPoint. Uh, so let me share my screen and then we've just got two case studies to kind of go over and then we'll do some questions. Let me get this back. Let's see, play from current slide. Okay, so our first case study that we looked at earlier was a um, right hemisphere stroke versus a left hemisphere stroke. So this second um, case study is uh, a patient actually that uh, we got to be just good friends with their family. Um, we found out his son, his son was actually, or his wife was my wife, was my son's uh, school teacher in Tenson when he went to a Nepali preschool. Um, so he was 45 and he was drinking, uh, fell down the stairs and it's presumed that he had a seizure when he was passed out um his head because his wife just found him unresponsive um so kind of some of that circumstance is unknown but it seems like that is probably what happened his head ct was normal so it showed no bleeding no hemorrhage no you know subdural hematoma anything like that but he was he was brought to the mission hospital in Tenzin with poor respiratory control um no responsiveness to any stimulation he was in our high dependency unit with an ng tube in place everyone was pretty much thinking we don't know what's wrong with this man should we send him home for kind of comfort palliative hospice care measures um, after about four to five days his breathing was regulated he needed a um high flow oxygen for a while he did not have to be intubated but he had to be on a um cpap machine uh, to kind of force air into his lungs, but he was able to come off of that. He was noted with, noted with occasional eye opening. Um, and then he's the one that I said, they just happened. Actually, I was walking by and I noticed it was my son's preschool teacher in there. And I found out about the case like that. 
Um, and so we started seeing him for some kind of stimulation things. We would spend 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, um, you know, doing hand over hand, helping him brush his hair, you know, putting lotion that was different smells on his face, um, you know, doing some painful stimulation to the nail beds, pinching the ears. And he started to move his right arm after about two weeks and we started to see some responses. Um, he started blinking his eyes with us and we were able to say, Can, if, if your name is Utum, blink one time. If your name is, um, I can't think of another name because Utum was his name. If your name is Bebek, blink two times. And he was able to ad accurately do that. Um, if I said, swallow your saliva, he would swallow his saliva. So we were starting to see responses that no one else had seen. And it was such a great thing because then we could say, you know, let's put him in the rehabilitation ward. Let's get physical therapy and occupational therapy in to start sitting him up, you know, to help doing a little bit more range of motion things. Um, after a month, he could say his own name. He could sit. He had a little bit of talking and some swallowing and he had some arm movement. Um, he went home at that point. Uh, he was supposed to come back weekly for therapy. That was in 2015. Um, and it was right at the earthquake, so he had about a month gap. When he came back, uh, he pulled his NG tube out by himself and was able to eat, which is the best case scenario. Um, he was standing up and transferring. He was communication, communicating some, but he still was very childlike, very basic. Um, so he worked with us. We did a lot of space retrieval techniques, which is um, a memory technique where you have a very specific question and a very specific response. Uh, so for Uchum, he was educated. We, his um, was the example I gave earlier of what do you do when you feel uh, anxious? What do you do when you feel fearful? And his was he had a card and it told a bit about his accident and it told where his family was and it told what he should do next. And so you start with reminding them at the one minute mark what do you do when you feel anxious? And then the response is, I get, I read my card. And when they, when he could recall that at one minute, we moved to three minutes, then we moved to five minutes, then we moved to 10 minutes. So all throughout our therapy session, we were doing space retrieval. So he would do other tasks. And then at the, you know, I'd have my um, phone with a timer and he would, I would say, I would set it for two minutes. And then when it beeped, I'd say, what do you do when you feel anxious? And sometimes he would say, I don't know. And so we'd go back to one minute. What do you do when you feel anxious? I read my card. Then he would read his card and <sighs> calm down. We, would, we were able to progress that to about a 30 minute recall. And then finally we were able to progress it to where he would just pick up the card instinctively and read it when he started to feel anxious. Um, so now uh, this is, well goodness, it's been five years since the earthquake, hasn't it? So um, now at the five year mark, he's able to stay independently by himself, he's not able to work, but he is able to stay home while his wife works. He makes his own takari roti in the morning. Um, he still is very impulsive and he still is very fixated on things. Um, so if he feels like he needs to go to the toilet, you will not stop him from going to the toilet, even if he just went 20 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, he gets fixated on it. Um, but he has an incredible short-term memory and long-term memory. Um, different people that he's met over the years, different therapists who were working in Tanzan with me when um, he was there, he still asked about them by name, which is pretty impressive for someone who was so brain injured. He still asked me, you know, what's she doing now? What's he doing now? People who visited those types of things. He, he remembers um, my children's names and he hasn't seen them in probably two years. Um, so that's a, it, it turned out to be pretty well. Uh, the last case, is um, another patient that I saw while in Tencent. So I'm about two, maybe two, two years ago, maybe three years ago at this point. Um, his name is Perna and he was working in the Middle East, got a brain injury. There, you know, there's, that's a whole nother uh, side story of the care that he got. Um, but anyways, he was returned to Nepal and he uh, was brought directly to the mission hospital because he had some pretty severe physical limitations. He had severe contractures in both arms, couldn't move, couldn't unbend his arm because it was so contracted and the same with one of his legs. 
Um, and he had no, he was very confused, but he was inappropriate. So he wasn't agitated anymore, but he was, what was wrong? What am I doing? What am I doing? Where am I? What's happened? What's happened? Didn't remember going to the Middle East, even though he'd been there for over a year. Um, couldn't even remember one word at the five second level. Um, today's Thursday. What day is it? I don't know. Today's Thursday. What day is it? Couldn't remember. Um, he stayed with us for six weeks. We were able to progress him. Thankfully, he could read. And so we made him a big chart hour by hour of what he should do. Nine o'clock, you get up, you go help your wife get the water. 10 o'clock, you have Dalbot. 11 o'clock, you do physical therapy. And we listed all the exercises. And he had a watch that had a beep on it. When it would beep on the hour, he would know to check his schedule. Um, he came for two months to therapy. Um, and he also, I forgot to say this point, he had a child that he couldn't, he thought he lost two years of his son's life. Um, and so he, he thought his son was an infant and then his child, his child was six years old. And so he was very confused about who this little boy was at his house. Um, actually, it was a really sad case. Um, anyways, he's doing much better now. Uh, right before we left Tencent, his wife was in the hospital having their second son. So that was a good sign of their marriage relationship. Um, he was able to help interact. He's helping at the house with uh, chores. And he is um, still has very horrible word recall. Now he saw us all, knew, knew our faces, but could not do any names. Um, but he was much more aware of the people and the surroundings. So those are the two case studies, uh, or three case studies, I guess. Um, so I think we could do some questions now, Bebeck. I think I'm going to do stop share. Yeah, okay. Is that, there we go. Yeah. There we are. And then I should be able to see the questions, I think, right? No, we haven't got any questions so far. And yeah, so I think okay. a part of it is because um, as far as I'm aware of, not many people do go to see the patient at the stage that you were explaining today. So not at the comatose level or when they are just recovering from that. So when they come to speech therapist, it's pretty late, I mean, at the later stage. I think so too. And I think that one of the things that we can all help do um, is to, you know, if you have a neuro ICU or if you have a, a you know, honestly in ortho units, Sometimes if you happen to have free time to go do some chart reviews mm -hmm. and talk with the nurses and then ask the doctor for referrals. This mm -hmm. part of speech therapy is a key component of what we are able to do in our scope of practice. But I think a lot of doctors don't know that we do that, especially um, I'm going to pick on ortho surgeons right now. Um, ortho surgeons are looking at the broken bones and they're looking at the spinal cord injuries and the fractures. Um, and they're not looking at the loss of consciousness or their brain, even if the family's telling them that they're not, <laughs> um, you know, doing things as well. Um, I will encourage you all to look through the PowerPoint, though, because a lot of the higher level functional things, especially for right hemisphere CBAs, we should be seeing um, those patients, I would think. Um, and the comatose patients, that's a challenge for you all. Um, to start trying to seek out and do something that's more uncomfortable um, with that kind of patient. All right, I see a Sarah, question from before, Indra. Before we go into the question, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, a guest lecturer last week who was here and she, uh, she wants to add something to the oh, presentation today. Yes, yes. So I know, I was so sad to miss her lecture, so yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, so Sonal Ma'am, you're, you're unmuted, can you? Yeah, thanks, Bebek. Thanks, Sarah. It was a very crisp lecture. And I'm happy people are in Nepal and you're practicing, you're helping patients there. I'm really glad. So good. Thank the you. Area, many people do not have a great exposure in terms of assessing the cognition, level of attention, the anterograde memory, retrograde memory, affecting communication. And I think the following communication, both have to be really worked. So do you have a good test material to uh, evaluate the Nepali population? So right now, and you guys can help me out as well. The only thing I've been able to find in Nepali is the RUDAS test, the Roland 
um, cognitive test. And then everything else that I've been using is informal. Um, okay. I did, um, I contacted so, the this oh, Nepali Association. I have one of my colleagues who is doing a doctorate in our institute. So I will be happy. I volunteer for the cognitive communicative rehab and I really want to advocate and I'm very happy from India if you can help the students and you are there also. So mm -hmm. I would be happy to share some of the our work, simple test material and that could be helpful, could be translated in the language also and the cognitive That's communicative great. protocol also. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I think any resources we can get, um, you know, would be helpful and especially... Do you have um, MOCA in ACE in Nepali? Do they have? I, I emailed the MOCA um, last week to ask them if it was in Nepali because I know it's in over a hundred languages and they have not emailed me back yet. So I'm, I'm working on that um, because I know, it's in, I know it's in so many of the different Indian languages. Yes, um, yes. We, are, we have made it valid also. We have gone mm -hmm. standardized now. But that yeah. basic MOCA in terms of where you don't have to have a literacy involved and the exactly. literate MOCA version. If you have this too, it would be helpful for the screening. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, do you have some of the test material for the mild TBI population? Because they are tricky and they would be doing very good. And then that would be something which this people can also be enlightened on. So uh, yeah. for the TBI, what do you use there? For, I'm sorry, for, uh, you cut out a little bit. For my, did you say, did you say myasthenia? Patients, yes, my traumatic brain injury patients. You know, everything I'm using right now is pretty much informal. So I think if you guys have some things that you've standardized, um, it'd be great to see. And um, yeah. yeah, anything, I if, try you, to see you know, if people great. can get in touch and then we can try working together and then yeah. the Nepali population can get help together mm -hmm. ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, what I'll try to do is uh, try to talk with uh, the population of uh, speech and hearing professionals who are more into speech and language part and then try to create a group and then work together to, you know, go ahead and translate some of the test materials into Nepal. No, no, it would be helpful for you. Yes, some therapy and some assessment basic tools. So that would be helpful for any clinician and that can uh, work for the dementia population, traumatic injury population, stroke population. Yes, I agree. It'd be great to yeah. have some of the other things. And I think anytime we can do any, um, you know, collaboration would be fantastic as well between the different speech associations. I'll be happy to help, Sarah. And you're doing good job. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> to India post-COVID. <laughs> Ah, thank you. Yeah, I don't want to come now, but post COVID, it would love to come. <laughs> yes. yes, true, true. <laughs> yeah, but please do email me so we can be in touch. I'd love to hear from sure. you more. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass on the email ID of Sonal Ma'am to you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Vivek. Okay, bye bye. Great work. Good thank you. conference. Yes. So, yeah, we have a few questions now. So, if you would like to go into the questions. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I see one from Indra. Yeah. Um, he's talking about the neuropsychiatric consultation to manage behavior. Sorry, there's a mosquito flying around. That's why I keep doing this, everyone. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> to manage behavioral emotional disturbances following TBI and right hemisphere stroke. Um, and then he mentions that there are neurochemical bases for emotional behavioral issues. Um, so should we address that first? Yes. Or then move on with core? So, um, Indra, you're totally right. Um, there are neurochemical bases for a lot of the emotional disturbances that you may see. And then there are also just because of the brain damage, you know, that part of the brain that has the regulation is not functioning as well. Um, best practice would be to manage concurrently with neuropsych. Um, I know in my uh, work in the U.S. and here in Nepal, um, finding a neuro a psychologist or psychiatrist who is um, accustomed to brain injuries is sometimes very difficult to do. Um, but these types of patients, you know, it's great to get them on something for sleeping. It's great to have them on an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety. Um, in the very early stages, there's some different medications that can help to stimulate the brain to help them wake up if they're in a comatose state. Um, but we should be going more concurrently 
as we're providing the cognitive behavioral treatment or as we're providing the you know interventions hopefully psychology or a really good um, general practitioner is managing some of the uh, neurochemical things usually both need to be focused on as well um, you know in patients that I see that are complaining of difficulty sleeping or that I see signs or symptoms of depression I usually go and approach the doctors myself and I say you know when they're with me I'm seeing a lot of emotional liability I'm seeing a lot of anger I'm seeing a lot of anxiety and poor attention what could we do from a medication standpoint to help with those things to help them do better in therapy and some doctors you know all over the world some doctors brush you off and say oh they'll be fine it's not that and then some doctors are responsive and can help you find their right choice um, but yeah concurrent treatment is going to be the best option um, and I think also we need to be sure to advocate for our patients that mental health issues um, are more prevalent in our patients with acquired brain injury and stroke acquired brain injury stroke traumatic brain injury have a much higher um, rate of depression uh, especially as their awareness increases. So we need to advocate for our patients to also get the right treatment and not just be brushed off, um, that they need to learn how to deal with it um, because there are proper uses for medication. Um, and then I, so I hope that answers your question enough, Indra. Um, I'm a firm believer in using everything you can. Um, there's my son, just, do you want to come and say hello? Okay, he doesn't want to say hello. Um, and then the Rudolph's in um, from Sabine. So from what I could find about the Rudolph's in, which was only one research study, um, was it was translated into Nepali by some physiotherapist. Um, and this is horrible. I can't even remember where in Kathmandu they were working. I read the study earlier or last week and now I can't remember about it. Um, but it was translated into Nepali. I could not find if it was validated into Nepali. Um, but what I'll do in, so, so sadly, I don't know if it's validated or not. Um, the mocha, if it's in Nepali, would have been validated, which would be great. Um, the Rudas is a piece of the puzzle. Um, so I would never give just a Rudas, just the same way I would never give just the goat or just the mocha. I would never give just this one test and if I got a normal, um, say, oh, they're fine. I'm gonna do it as part of my assessment. So my informal assessment is gonna count to me as much as my formal assessment. And that's my practice. If I'm doing it in English, if I'm doing it in Nepali, um, your informal assessment counts. These tests are all made um, aside from the GOAT, which is the Galveston, Galveston Orientation Amnesia Test, um, they are all made for dementia populations. They've been co-opted and used for brain injury populations, um, which is fine. They're great tests, and they're good to have some sort of standard measure, but they would never be the definitive word. Um, I will send you guys the link to this one study I found, and then in the study, at the very, very end of the study, is the RUDAS form that's been translated into Nepali, or that's in Nepali, um, and I'll send you that as well so that you can start using it in practice. Um, our occupational therapists right now at Green Pastures are doing the RUDAS with some patients, um, and they've, they've been liking it as a guidance for them to kind of know what to focus on and what to look at. Um, so yeah, so I'll send that on as well. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Um, my guess is it's probably not been standardized and validated. Um, my guess is just, just probably been translated and checked, but that's just what, what I'm assuming by what I read. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for answering that question. So uh, we don't have much question, as I said, maybe yeah. because that's the population which we are not dealing with. And then I think the advocacy is one of the things which so not mom as well she highlighted that we need to advocate ourselves into mm -hmm. seeing those patients and making the changes like you said like you know being the, with the patient yeah. for 15 minutes and mm -hmm. so the difference so definitely i think that will be way moving forward from here and i'd like to thank you for your very crisp presentation and i definitely enjoyed it because you have like it, it's not like presentation it's almost like talking and explaining things <laughs> to you so 
I pretty much like that way. So thank you again. And to all the participants who are here, I'm going to share a link and I'd like you to fill the link within another 15 minutes or so because when we end the webinar, it will be active for 15 minutes. And after that, the processing will be done for the certificates and you will get the certificate mailed to you. And yet, kindly provide correct information so that we, we can share the information which Sarah is interested in sharing with you as well. So thank you all for joining. If you can see the chat section, I've shared the link there. And we'll hope to see you next week. Um, on Saturday, we have another webinar on basics of new imaging for stroke patients. So we'd like to see you all there. See you then. Have a good day. Stay home. Stay safe. Thank bye -bye. you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bebek, do you have one second to chat so I can ask you a couple questions? Uh, yeah, we can do that. So, Would it be better for us to... What I'll do is I'll give you a call in WhatsApp. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. I'll leave the section on so that if anybody is finding difficulty with the form, so the link will be active until the uh, webinar is on. So I'll leave it on for some time. Yeah, we'll see. You. I'll call you, Sarah. Yeah.